Howdy everybody, it's your AP Bio teacher, Mr. Poser. Today we are starting our second unit of the entire school year. It is called Cell Structure and Function. So that's right, this whole unit is going to be focused on the most basic unit of life, which is the cell. How it exchanges nutrients and matter with its environment, why that's important, and all of the inner workings of the cell, because this is going to really lay the groundwork for the rest of the class because we need to start from the basics, right? So in our last unit, it was all focused on molecules and all these different molecules make up these cells. And then we're gonna work our way up from there. Uh, we're actually gonna be talking about cells for like the whole year, so be prepared for that. So this is why we're getting a good introduction to cell structure and function in this unit. So let's get into it. Topic 2.1 starts with the subcellular components. So it's 2.1 cell structure, subcellular components. So that means what are the components that make up a cell? And yeah, I just said that molecules make up cells, but you know, cell, all cells have uh, functional organelles or other components within them that you know help them carry out functions. So let's get into it. Um, first thing I would like to point out here is that all life, if you are a living thing, you are made up of one or more cells. Um, and we can split all of life and we can categorize it into two main groups based on whether they have their DNA in a nucleus and they have membrane bound organelles or whether they don't. So eukaryotic cells or eu eukaryotic cells, also known as eukaryotes, um, are the ones that contain the DNA in the nucleus and they have membrane bound organelles. So we ourselves as human beings, we are eukaryotes. Um, this includes all animals, plants, fungi, and some protists. I think all protists actually. Um, but the point is, is that all of these cells have organelles like your mitochondria and your Golgi apparatus, all that stuff. Um, those are bound by membranes and we keep our DNA in the nuclei of our cells. Um, so therefore we are eukaryotes. The opposite of that is a prokaryotic cell or a prokaryote. Um, and these are your bacteria and another domain called archaea, um, which are very, very ancient organisms. That's why they're called archaea. Um, they do not keep DNA in, in an organelle. They don't keep it in the nucleus and they do not have any membrane bound organelles. So they don't have the endomembrane system like eukaryotes do. Um, so these are our Prokaryotes are all single-celled organisms. Eukaryotes are single-celled or multi-celled organisms as well. Um, and what we're going to be, well, we're going to be studying both today, but what we'll be talking about um, towards the end of this video are the different organelles that are within eukaryotic cells. And we're not going to get into all of them today, but we're going to hit on some of the major ones. All right, let's keep going here. Let's talk about what all cells have. It doesn't matter if you're a prokaryote or a eukaryote, it doesn't matter. All cells have cytosol, ribosomes, and a plasma membrane. So let's start talking about cytosol here. That is a jelly-like substance that holds subcellular components. Now, in a previous bio class, you may have thought this was called cytoplasm, which is often confused for, but however, cytosol is the jelly-like substance that holds it all together, while cytoplasm is more referred to, the ter it's the term that refers to any of the contents that are within the cell, so within the plasma membrane, but outside of the nucleus. Um, that's referred to as the cytoplasm. So cytosol is that fluid in between the organelles, right? So you may have made a cell model in the past and you had a little jelly part and you called it the cytoplasm, but that's actually cytosol. Sorry to burst your bubble there. Um, all cells also have ribosomes. Ribosomes are not organelles. That's a common mistake. Uh, misconception as well. Ribosomes are not organelles because A, they belong in uh, both prokaryotes and eukaryotes and they are not bound by a membrane, so therefore they are not organelles. They are complexes that are both made of RNA, it's called rRNA, ribosomal RNA, and protein. And their job is to synthesize proteins. We learned in our last unit that proteins do pretty much everything um, besides, you know, make up the cell membrane, provide energy storage, provide instant energy, genetic information, that kind of stuff. Proteins pretty much do everything else, so all living things need to have proteins and thus ribosomes um, to make those proteins. And finally, all cells have a plasma membrane. It is a selective barrier of the cell and it controls what goes in or out. Um, so really the components, the structure of the, the cell membrane and all the different proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane really determine how and what the cell is going to exchange with its environment. 
Um, so in terms of nu nutrients, waste, toxins, all that stuff. Uh, we are going to talk about cell membrane a lot in this unit as it is an extremely important concept uh, for not only studying just cells, but like the, the human body itself and how many of your organ systems work. Um, so obviously this isn't all about humans. This class isn't all about humans, but um, very, very important concept to know for biology. Um, so as I was stating before, prokaryotic cells do not contain organelles. Eukaryotic cells do contain organelles, and those are membrane-enclosed structures. Um, so we will not cover every one of these arrows on this animal cell down here, uh, but we will cover several of them in this video, and I'm going to try and keep it brief here. We're just skimming the surface on these uh, the functions of these organelles, and we will get into the more detail about each of these uh, later on in this unit. Um, so first of all, our first organelle that we're going to start with is called the endoplasmic reticulum. It's really fun to say, or it's also known as the ER. I'm going to be referring to it as the ER from now on. It is an, an extensive membrane network continuous the mem with the membrane of the nucleus. Uh, and the membrane of the nucleus is called the nuclear envelope. Uh, so if we're looking at our model here, the suit nucleus is right here, uh, right in the middle, and there's the nucleolus right there, but the nuclear envelope is another, it's a double membrane that surrounds the nucleus. Um, and that's going to be important later on when we're talking about transcription and translation and protein synthesis. However, the nuclear envelope as a membrane is continuous with this uh, kind of labyrinth of membranes, these blue membranes right here, and that's called the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so endo means inner, plasma, plasma is referring to the cytoplasm, so it's, with, it's a membrane system within the cytoplasm, and reticulum refers to, it's kind of like waviness. Yeah. Uh, there's two different parts to the ER, and they two have uh, different functions. So one um, is called the smooth ER, and it's referring to this kind of, these folds right here. Um, it's called the smooth ER because it has no ribosomes attached to it. So we just discussed what ribosomes are. These are the protein factories of the cell. These are the sites of protein synthesis. Um, and the smooth ER does not have any ribosomes attached. So therefore, the smooth ER, the function of it, um, since it doesn't have those ribosomes, is to synthesize lipids. And it helps detoxify poisons as well. So uh, certain organs in your body, like maybe your liver, are going to be processing a lot of the, well, to that any toxins that come into your body. Um, so liver cells tend to have a lot more smooth ER than, say, your muscle cells, which aren't really, that's not their job. Uh, but yes, that's smooth ER. It's smooth because, again, no ribosomes as opposed to the rough ER, which, is, which does have ribosomes, and it's much more extensive. Um, so this is a, again, ribosomes are the sites of protein synthesis. So when a protein is produced at one of these ribosomes that is embedded into the rough ER, what it can do, it can label proteins and package them in vesicles. And vesicles are little kind, kind of little bubbles of, uh, of cell membrane that can move around the cell and fuse with other membranes. Um, so it's a really cool way to, to pick up things and drop things off within the cell. Um, but what this rough ER does, you know, once a protein is produced in one of these ribosomes, it packages it up and sends it where it needs to go. And it can label it, uh, label it with a carbohydrate and make glycoproteins as well. All right. Uh, so moving on from there, another part of what we call the endomembrane system, endo meaning inner membrane system, endo, inner membrane, right? Uh, it's called the Golgi complex, or also known as the Golgi apparatus, and these are flattened membrane sacs, um, and their job is to ensure the correct folding and packaging of new proteins. Um, it's all referred to commonly as the warehouse of the cell. Now, we don't want to use all these weird analogies for all the organelles of a cell because... You know, cells are a little more complicated than, you know, just saying, oh, you know, this is the warehouse, you know, Golgi apparatus or the complex really does more than that. Um, but anyway, the Golgi complex is these uh, these green membranes right here. Um, and what we can see here, these little tiny blue dots, I believe these are representing proteins that were newly synthesized. Um, it can package them in a similar way to the rough ER. I can package them. And then the Golgi complex's real job is to, A, you know, figure out whether a newly synthesized protein needs to stay within the cell or need, if it needs to go out of the cell or if it needs to stay within the plasma membrane. That's the job of the Golgi apparatus is to um, figure out what to do with these newly synthesized proteins. Um, so as I put down here, it receives vesicles 
from the ER, from the endoplasmic reticulum, and it can send to the plasma membrane or other parts of the cell. Um, so it has two faces to it, and one's called the cis face, and it receives uh, vesicles from the ER, and the trans face sends the vesicles out to other parts of the cell, or even out of the cell. All right, let's keep going here. So moving on from the endomembrane system, we have the powerhouse of the cell. You might know what it is. It is the mitochondrion. I don't know. I just like saying this a lot because it's, it's almost like a meme at this point. Like, oh, I learned in school that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Right? So, like, I don't know. I just like putting it there and making fun of that. Uh, but, yeah, the mitochondrion, uh, it doesn't just, like, produce electricity. Like, that kind of, it kind of, saying it's the powerhouse of the cell kind of, like, puts an image in your mind that it's just shooting off electricity all the time. It's like giving the cell energy, but it's really just the site of what we call cellular respiration, which is ATP production. We're going to talk extensively about cellular respiration in our third unit. Um, and an important thing to note about the mitochondrion is that it has two membranes. It is a double membrane uh, organelle. It has an inner membrane with lots of folds in it called Christi and then it has an outer membrane as well. So the fact that it has two membranes, um, and it actually has its own ribosomes and its own DNA, um, are evidence for what we call endosymbiosis theory or endosymbion theory, which we're going to talk about in topic 2.11. All right, um, so we'll talk about that more later. But what you need to know is that the mitochondrion is double membrane, and it ha is the site of ATP production. So the lysosome is another protein that, we're, or excuse me, uh, organelle that we're going to talk about. It is a sac of hydrolytic enzymes that break down macromolecules. Um, so this is the organelle that is going to be digesting um, macromolecules that are no longer needed, or you know, are sh should be broken down into smaller molecules. So let's take apart this word here, hydrolytic. What is that referring to? That's referring to hydrolysis, right? So the lysosome is going to be breaking apart um, covalent bonds, maybe even peptide bonds between proteins, glycosidic linkages between carbohydrates. It's going to be breaking apart those covalent bonds with the power of water um, through hydrolysis, right? So those are the lysosomes. We got one over here, one right over there as well. Uh, let's continue. So the next few organelles are exclusive to plant cells, and we're going to be talking about um, a few things in the plant cell, and yes, we are going to be talking about plants a lot in this class as well, so get used to it. Um, so here's a plant cell. Let's keep talking here. A vacuole. What is a vacuole? It's a large vesicle that can serve a variety of functions. It can contain nutrients, and it controls the water within the cell. Now, animal cells also have vacuoles. I just want to point that out, that they're, they're these large vesicles that can can serve for storage, they can store up a bunch of water, um, they can do a lot of different things. But um, why I referred to, uh, why I referred to the vacuole as being a part of the plant cell is because plant cells have what we call a central vacuole, and it's really, really big, and it's right in the middle here. Um, and in fact, plant cells are able to stay rigid. Um, they, well, A, because they have a cell wall that's made of cellulose, a complex carbohydrate, um, and also because it, the, it's able to control how much water is in or out of that vacuole pretty easily. So when, so think of a plant, right? So it can like wilt or like go limp when it does not have enough water because it doesn't have, the water provides what we call turgor pressure um, and it allows the plant to stay rigid within those cell walls and it's largely due to how, how much water is being stored in that vacuole. Um, so yeah, the central vacuole in plants, it also enables growth, like I was saying, it allows its plants to stay rigid, and it can store ions as well. Ions will play a very, very important role in maintaining cell membrane function, which we'll talk about in this unit as well. All right, uh, so chloroplasts, these are plant exclusive, plant and algae exclusive, because these are the sites of photosynthesis, another topic that we will discuss a lot in our third unit. Um, and this is the site where it, uh, solar energy, the energy from the sun, is converted into chemical energy. Um, so using uh, energy from the sun, using some carbon dioxide, plant cells can produce their own glucose, um, which can then be used for cellular respiration. Um, yeah, pretty big deal. Photosynthesis happens in the chloroplast. Um, another thing to note is that chloroplasts are similar to mitochondria in that they have two membrane systems. So they have 
Um, well, we're going to talk about the structure of a chloroplast in our next topic, actually. Um, but chloroplasts also have two membrane systems there. Uh, cytophotosynthesis. And that's it for this, uh, this topic, actually. I thought there was more, but I was wrong. Please let me know if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, we'll see you next time when we're talking more about mitochondria and chloroplasts. Bye.